The following video contains spoilers for a 10-year-old rum hack. Additionally, violence, gore, and mature themes. Don't say I didn't warn you. Long, long ago, in the ancient year of 2009, was the annual Earthbound Central Halloween Hacking Contest. And one of the participants, Radiation, better known now as Toby Fox, took said contest by storm. The hack was a technical marvel for its time, including custom sprite work, level designs, and music. It won the contest handily, and received a good amount of praise from the close-knit, earthbound community. The custom music specifically got the attention of one Andrew Hussey, which led to Toby becoming the contributor to Homestuck's soundtrack, and eventually its lead composer. And then in 2014, Toby launched a Kickstarter and demo for his own little RPG game that you might have heard of. It's Undertale. The rest is history. So why this analysis, you might ask? Why now, after 10 years after the hack's technical achievements seem quaint in the light of new projects like Unearthed? Why this when we have Undertale and Deltarune and Sans and Smash? Because this is where it all began. Undertale has been analyzed to death by now, and Deltarune is already in the same boat. For a lot of people, the hack is just that weird old thing Toby did that has that offensive rant in it. I'm not making this to prove those people wrong, because on one level, it is exactly that. To me, the flaws and imperfections it admittedly does have make it more deserving of study, not less. So I'm going to try and look at the hack on its own merits, in so much as that it's actually possible. At the very least, I'm trying to keep the Undertale references to a minimum here. That game has already taken over the internet, and I think most of the comparisons would be low-hanging fruit. Plus, I think the hack has enough unique themes to stand on its own anyway. So we're going back to the beginning, with fresh eyes and the benefit of hindsight, and we'll be referring to Toby's The Making Of document included with the hack as we continue. Got it? Good. Wait, wait, that that's the old intro. That's that's the same did I patch this ROM right? No, no, wait, that's new. The whole first part of the hack just gives off a feeling of laziness on Toby's part. We wake up in Ness's bed. Tucson is just recolored orange. The enemies are also basic recolors. The music's a pretty nice version of the love theme. A dozen little tiny things that just makes it seem that everything's business as usual in the world of Earthbound. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Here's our new main character, the red-haired, shadow-eyed, knife-toting, leather-wearing, booze-loving bounty hunter, Varric. He's a direct reference to the Brandish series, and he deliberately contrasts with our former protagonist, Ness. There's more to unpack there. We'll get to it. It's Halloween, or possibly the day before. Varric gets literally dragged into the theater to meet with Mayor B.H. Perkle, who tells you the Rosemary family's been killed. by a monster. 
and it's up to you to kill that monster. Well, alrighty then. A bit dark, but it is Halloween, right? There's a plot. There's a monster that needs killing. It makes sense. And Perkle's right. Varric's just the man to do it. So then you take a nice walk around Tucson and appreciate how bright and colorful the fall is. But why Tucson, though? Everything's been given a nice Halloween makeover, even the food. And the NPC dialogue is quite good. Some of it references what they said in Earthbound, and some of it's completely new. Sure, some jokes stand out as being quite out there. I think there's a few references to Earthbound's community back then, stuff like that. There aren't really any blatant memes or references like I had suspected there might be. Most of the dialogue is funny on its own. As you continue to explore, it gradually becomes obvious something is rotten in the town of Tucson. The fear of the monster is an underlying insidious presence and people are struggling to ignore it. And it really gets you pumped up to be the hero and stop that monster and save Halloween. You really feel like Varric loves this place. And the people of Tucson love him too. Well, some of them do. The girl at Mock Pizza at least. This is the OTP, don't have me. Like Perkle mentions, Varric just arrived in town several months ago. Most people don't care much about him. If anything, the townsfolk are looking up to Paula as a hero after her unfortunate demise. This kid mentions how she beat Gygas on her own, which is kinda true. The others at the preschool are torn between mourning her loss and trying to move on like she would have undoubtedly wanted them to. And no one even remembers Ness's name, which feels a bit harsh. At least it does make some sense that Paula, who's lived in town her whole life, would overshadow the rest of the party, who spent only a couple days there at most. Continuing to explore, you quickly find yourself feeling claustrophobic. The tunnel to three is filled with ghosts again, which is fair enough, it's Halloween, right? But the routes to Peaceful Rest Valley and Onet are filled with super death monsters that one-shot you. In most games, these serve as indicators you need to come back later when you're stronger. In this game, they're just here to kill you. Even if you manage to ninja your way past them somehow, you're still blocked off. You have no choice but to enter the sewers. So enter the sewers you do. First of all, you go left. This garbage can lid, fittingly found in a garbage can, makes for a pretty decent shield. After you get some cash, buy yourself a rapier from the Rasta in the park, and stock up on baked goods. Fighting off hippies, trash can ghosts, and rats lulls you into a false sense of security. It's difficult, but it's nothing a little level grinding can't handle, right? Right?
it might not be the hyper-realistic stuff of a bad internet copypasta, but the jump from slightly edited stuff to completely new sprites and messages gets under your skin. At least it got under mine. In fact, I think the new battle messages are probably the scariest because they leave your imagination to fill in the blanks. Sure, some of it comes off a bit overdone and cheesy, but in general I think it fits the shift in tone. Especially when enemies waste their turns by laughing maniacally, or the remnants lifts quotes from Gygus instead of attacking you. Oh yeah, we're in winters now, and everything's super bleak. It really sells that this is the end of the world. You have no choice but to head south, and the new and confusing level design feels like you're stumbling around blindly. From the colors to the music to the undead monsters and desperate survivors, it feels like everything's just barely clinging to life, including Varric. Considering the enemies in this area can kill you in just two or three hits, let's have a little talk about difficulty. Using status spells is absolutely vital in this hack. The monster book you can buy mentions which enemy status weaknesses are. Inanimate objects are weak to time stop. Living enemies are weak to sleep. And undead are weak to white shock. That's cool. I like it. But it isn't always obvious which enemy fits which category. For example, is the revenant undead or mechanical? They're weak to time stop, so does that mean they're some kind of robot zombie? Toby included a strategy guide with the hacks files which tells you what's effective on each enemy. And I appreciate that help, because trial and error without save states is brutally unforgiving. Varric doesn't have much in the way of power points early on, so it's really hard to have enough to keep casting these spells. And he doesn't get life up either, at all, forcing you to rely on healing items. At least you don't have anywhere near the undroppable quest items that you did in Earthbound, which is a small mercy. You actually don't even get life up until Pooh arrives for the final dungeon, and even then, its cost has been raised, making it pretty impractical. I don't think increasing the power point cost of moves across the board was a good idea. You're at low level, so you already don't have very many points, and for basic moves to take up so much just encourages you to play very conservatively and use PSI Magnet on stunned enemies, which makes these fights take even longer. Toby seems to have expected some of this, which might be why later dungeons have magic butterflies around. That's nice, but they spawn at random, and it can be frustrating having just spent several turns refilling Paula with Magnet, only to find a butterfly right afterward. It's a quick fix, a bandage on top of an underlying issue. I can appreciate the high difficulty producing feelings of dread and uncertainty, but I think it takes things a little too far. Many enemies will easily kill you if you don't use the single correct strategy. Level grinding is practically necessary in several places. And in general, it feels like this was designed with the use of safe states in mind. Earthbound already had some pretty big spikes in difficulty. The hack without a guide is even more so, like a brick wall. But I do feel like it deserves credit for making several gameplay mechanics actually useful. Jeff's spy command, for one. Knowing enemy weaknesses is a lot more important when you need to know what those weaknesses are to win. There are also a few interesting tricks here and there. They're mostly just explained in the attached guide and aren't hinted in the game itself. Pooh's mirror is great against a handful of enemies. The HP sucker is the best attack for getting through a later boss's defenses. Stuff like that. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. After a long and arduous trek, we finally arrive at the lab. The narration gives us some more cryptic and menacing information before we finally enter, building us up for some kind of terrible revelation or dramatic confrontation.
but it's just the lab. Starkly lit, like always. Silent as the grave. Trying to leave just fades to white. You have no choice but to talk to Dr. Andonuts. The doctor swings in between a relatively normal tone, a broken whimper, and deranged screaming, and he manages to realize that we're here to kill him. So he shuts himself in his magic ant machine. It's a plot contrivance, but I don't think it's a bad one. The presentation makes it worthwhile, in my opinion. The narration continues to mock you, with the idea of choice, presenting you with a selection prop that only gives you a single choice. This mechanic that has always signified your ability to decide things has betrayed you. You have to kill the doctor. And after some deeply uncomfortable congratulations, the game ends. Or you could push the B button instead and break reality. Note that the hacks tagline actually does tell you what to do, it just doesn't say when to do it. And by doing so, you thereby unlock the remaining two-thirds of the game. So, we're on Magicant now. In Earthbound, this area was the physical representation of Ness's subconscious, his f joys, his fears, what makes him happy, and a bunch of miscellaneous weird stuff. Here, it's much the same, except this is the Doctor's Magicant. It shows us what lies inside the mind of a monster. Despite that, this feels like a massive relief, after all the events leading up to this point. It's not overtly scary anymore. There's a good mixture between funny, bizarre, and unsettling, that should be familiar to anyone who's played Earthbound. In fact, you feel like you could just stay here forever, hiding away from reality and its harshness. Just like the Doctor is. But we both know that isn't going to happen. The music is a version of the original Magicant theme, but it's slightly different. The chimes are replaced with a more artificial, computerized sound, which may fit the Doctor's more analytical mind. Exploring shows us all the NPCs now have new dialogue, Ranging from thought-provoking. To unnerving. To, uh... Uh... Anyway, it's pretty great stuff. The darker, more introspective elements go well with the surreal humor, keeping things from getting too dark, while still building up the intrigue. I like how the flying men don't even know what courage is, because the Doctor's courage is missing and forgotten. Your quest here is to go and find courage so you can make it through the Sea of Eve and confront him. 
And to facilitate this, Magic Ant has several amenities. An inn free of charge, and a shop for stocking up on items. Be sure to nab plenty of Magic Taffy, it's one of the few mercies the hack offers you. Once you're ready, enter the metal building. This talking bear explains the dungeon's increase in difficulty towards the left. So we enter the rightmost door, and we find ourselves in a familiar place. This part of the game. Dead on that tugged at my heartstrings when I first played it. And this time around, I actually caught myself tearing up. Call it nostalgia or whatever, but everything about this part. The music, the enemies, the remember me's giving you hugs that paralyze you, and all of these signs. It really feels like this place is a manifestation of lost childhood. All the regrets and lost memories and everything you shut away for so long. There's very little actual gameplay here. The remember me's barely hurt at all and they drop sky nectar. Just be careful to not try opening the town's doors. They don't work anymore, and these enemies which are harmless can get you stuck because you can't fight them. So you have to reload your last save, and it, it's really unfortunate. It's a blemish on an otherwise stellar chapter. On reflection, it's actually my favorite part of the game. It knows exactly what it's trying to do and it hits perfectly, at least for me. I also tried to make it to the secret hideout and you can't enter, sadly. These cops seem to be having a good time back there, though. So climbing the hill and making it to the meteor, there's a conveniently placed phone to save, which should be an indication there's a boss fight coming up, and with it, a return from just general trauma to the doctor's trauma. Uh, no? Oh. So we meet the No Trio, manifestations of the Doctor's guilt. I like this fight, both the symbolism and how it plays out. You want to be at least level 8 so you have Sleep Stun, or Hypnosis Omega, and use that. And after that, both ways of defeating it are also symbolic. You can just run away from your problems, which is surprising for an RPG boss. He won't get any XP or money, but it's probably easier than fighting it. Or you can just kick it in the groin repeatedly. This kills the boss. So basically, the guy has issues. Several hints here and there indicate it's not just his repressed sexuality, too. This kid mocks him for being a nerd. The signs speak about torn relationships and a lack of friends. This is just my theory, but I don't think Dr. Andonuts really had anyone he could really confide in outside of his wife. And when she's gone, he just falls apart even faster. That's just one interpretation, though. I actually like how much of his past is left ambiguous and subtextual, but it does mean it's difficult to interpret what's intentional as unreliable narration and what's not. I'm nowhere near qualified to discuss how well the hack lives up to these intentions, but it's at least interesting for us to think about, even if the execution is somewhat inconsistent in tone. The early part of the game's subversion of lightheartedness is straightforward enough, but once you enter Magic Hand, it's pretty much non-stop mood whiplash. Sometimes it's intentionally bleak, and sometimes it's black comedy. I don't consider this necessarily bad, though. Earthbound and other games based on it deliberately shift their tone and seriousness, and I really like that because it's done well there. In the hack, the changes sometimes feel indecisive. Like it can't decide how self-serious it should be about any given theme. Maybe that's because the hack was rushed for the contest, maybe, maybe it's just Toby's inexperience as a writer at the time. Funnily, there's evidence that parts of the plot were cut for being too out there, which is, uh, definitely saying something considering the final game. For the record, I don't dislike the themes and concepts here in this hack. I just think they're quite unrefined. 
I really like how the Doctor has a consistent avoidant attachment style, taking what was originally portrayed as absent-minded quirkiness in Earthbound, and painting him as a deeply lonely and troubled man who won't let anyone else in to comfort him. He's hiding away in his lab, hiding in his machine, and hiding inside the Sea of Eve. After the fight, the Doctor openly mourns his wife's death, and finally admits that he needs courage. And Courage replies. Paula joins. She comes with a frying pan, which isn't too useful, her melee is still awful, and her teddy bear. Nice until it breaks. She's a huge help even if the cost of her attack PSI has been increased, which makes Thunder even more useless. You're just going to be using Freeze anyway, and maybe fire on the few guys weak to it. The second dungeon lacks the thematic consistency of Onet being more of a jumbled up pastiche of other places. But it does have some more great dialogue. This scene between the Andonuts makes the frustration and sorrow almost palpable. There's also some of the hack's best jokes in here, too. Navigate in this place is annoying. These doors warp you around. If you can make it to the boss room and leave, you get sent back to the dungeon start, which is uh, bad. Don't do that. At least they do give you a save and free heal before the said boss. But before that, we get this remarkably touching scene of Jeff's meeting his father from Earthbound but this time we see it from Jeff's perspective. There's an awkward earnestness here. More than anything, it shows the Doctor really did care about his son, even if he never managed to show it. The actual fight isn't too complicated. Use a Psycho P Spirit sp spirit for a full party PSI shield and bounce his freeze attacks back at him. He's actually weak to freeze, and if he gets solidified, that just gives you more time to wail on him. A bit of luck involved, but it's not that difficult compared to the enemies before. So which party member joins next? If you guess Jeff, you're correct. His attack isn't as good as Varric's, but the HP sucker means he can heal himself easily. Sadly, he lacks the rest of his Earthbound gadgets. The third dungeon starts off in a unique manner, the Museum of Dead People. This is a never favorite scene of mine, it really encapsulates the mixture of the macabre with the fascinating. The Doctor is so far gone at this point, he's overcome with guilt and self-hatred, to the point he can't help but claim his actions were always deliberately malicious. He claims he killed his wife, but Toby's comments make me think that's not literally true. He's just blaming himself for her death because he wasn't there for her.
but then the actual dungeon starts. It's a copy of Belch's factory, littered with side rooms that contain useful gear for Varric and Jeff. This is a good place to level grind with the healing station and magic butterflies. The spawn rate is also sky high, but it feels like a slog to get through. It doesn't help the layout's just the same as the original dungeon. At least the Mr. Saturns are still here. But thankfully, the boss is more interesting. The Phase Dis Destroyer. Manifestation of the Doctor's fear and grief about building said machine. Has a good variety of attacks, single and party hitting physicals, along with PK Thunder. His defense is sky high. And he's also packing a power shield, leaving Varric best left on support duty. Thankfully, the HP sucker does massive damage to him. It's a bit luck-based if Paula's gonna get flattened or not, but that's really just par for the course. The Doctor then has a somber moment of introspection about how all the things he's ever invented are worthless. But hey, at least we finally get Pooh back. Once you pick up the sword and cloak of kings, he becomes a lot more capable of a fighter. And now that the gang's all back together, I think it's a good time to talk a bit more about our party, especially our main man, Varric. It's hard for me to judge how successful he is at being a blank slate. I can't help but read things into his character. Is he deceiving himself, or is the narrator intentionally lying to him and us? We don't know a lot about his past at all, but at least a few people in Tucson like him. His own thoughts seem to indicate he's happy there. That's probably why I like how the ending is so much. It feels nice and cozy after everything else that's happened. I do like how he's explicitly a bounty hunter. He uses a knife and leather armor, and the gameplay encourages you to spend a lot of the early game running back and forth to avoid groups of enemies and to pick off the stragglers. Later, he learns support magic and gets some shiny magic armor and a legendary sword and shield, fitting him more into the classic RPG knight role. I think it's a nice representation of character development just through the gameplay. And we can't forget that the hack makes strange connections between him and Ness. Repeatedly. So, uh, what does all this mean? I don't know. My personal theory is that it's an another metafictional connection. Technically, Ness didn't slay Gygas, you did. And because you're now controlling Varric, who's filling the same role with many of the same powers, despite Varric being a different person completely, this relationship between player and player character will be further explored in, uh, Toby Slater stuff. And as for the rest of the party, the Chosen Four are actually alive, but they returned to a different timeline. Are these Anonuts' cognitive creations of them, the way he viewed them and representing his courage? Or are these the actual heroes, using psychic powers to project themselves here? The naming screen mentions the lost heroes, which is how Varric and the rest of this timeline see them, but we don't get any clear answer either way. If anything, I'm leaning towards they're the real deal because of Pooh's comments about how the timelines differ. But that could go either way, really. So once you have all the party members, you can continue through the blue area to the Sea of Eve. You also can notice how much easier things have gotten now most fights are four on one. You can beat these enemies way easier now, which is a great feeling of catharsis while it lasts. And now you have a lot more options to use in the fights, making things easier in general. Touch the tentacle, and you're warped to a new area that screams endgame. Bleak jumbled up tiles. The enemies are strong, but well worth fighting for the money drops and frequent healing items. I found my inventory stuffed full here, which was kind of amusing. Just a brief discussion, I think this area has the best enemies in the hack. The transdimensional terminate drops a lot of cash and his only dangerous move is PK Thunder. The Brain Buster has super high defense, making him kind of a pain. The HP Sucker helps, but not that much. At least Time Stops shuts him down completely, meaning he's a source of free power points. And finally, we have the winner of the Personal Favorite Enemy Award. Give it up for the Gige League!
This fancy-looking star man packs a mean right hook. He has PK Rock in to hit your whole party. A full party heal, and they can even poison you. So how do you turn the tables on him? Hypnosis puts him to sleep, which is a start. He also only has 12 power points, meaning Magnet takes away his worst moves easily. Also, Pooh's mirror is really useful because his super punch is so strong, and you get the full party heal for only 8 power points. It's worth the risk of the randomization. I really like this guy's design. I like how you've got a bunch of different options to take care of him. I like that with the right strategy you can absolutely flatten a difficult enemy. And I like that he crumples into a wad of paper when he dies. And he drops pumpkin loaves a lot too. Progressing through the area, you pick up Varric's iconic legendary sword, the Planet Buster from the Brandish series. Despite the grandiose description, it only deals a bit more damage than the... The Kaledfulsh. But anyway, it's still nice to have. The next segment is just the cave of the past, but rainbow colored. I like the recolor at least, even if it does drag on a little too long. Once you're through that, there's another phone. It's time for another boss fight. Welcome to the innermost part of the Sea of Eve. Meet the crack, I mean the amalgamates. And they're awful. They have a whole bunch of deadly attacks and no real status weaknesses except for white shot gamma. But that one hit kill is pretty luck based and I never got it to work. They take a lot of punishment if Paula goes down here in big trouble without freeze. And time stop really sucks when the enemies are using it on you. It's frustrating you don't get any revival items until after this part. And it's frustrating these guys are way harder than any of the other boss fights, in my opinion. Level grinding might help, but that's boring, especially when proper strategy is usually enough to get you to this point. You can skip fighting the second and third ones, which I recommend if possible, it's not like they drop anything worthwhile. But instead of the Manny Manny statue, there's just Mrs. Andonuts. Also, her uh, dialogue is pretty interesting. That's oddly fitting for the turn the plot's about to take next. You find yourself back in Tucson, but it's just a little bit of an area, the tiles don't even align. While some other areas represent the Doctor's mind, this place feels like it's 100% Varric, and the conflict here is obvious. His desire to just stop and go home again, versus the harsh reality that he really can't. The portal is useless. The only way out is through. Even though you and Varric know this is the end, that it's going to be something horrible, your resolve does not waver. There's one last shop to get stocked up before the big finale, and a warp point that can send you back to the Magic Ant Hub if you somehow made it here without any money or items, so you're not completely softlocked. And once you're all stocked up, you step between the trees, and the world melts away around you.
The original, the venerable, Megalovania. Before Undertale, before Homestuck, and before people started to hate this song for being overrated, there was the final boss of the hack. It's a good song, in my opinion, the worthy embodiment of final bossitude. It's clearly the song Toby put the most work into, and was the most proud of, which is especially impressive considering how hard it was to program music on the Super Nintendo at the time. Toby claims it's a bit inspired by the final boss music from Brandish 2, which I can sort of hear. But the incredible part to me is this song almost didn't even exist. I do realize many of you are thoroughly sick by Megalovania by now, but think about what the world would be like if it didn't exist. That's probably not helping my case, but anyway. The second meme is the Doctor's infamous pre-battle speech. Probably the most remembered part of the hack and one of the biggest reasons why Toby looks back on the whole thing as an embarrassment. The speech gives everything an over-the-top and ridiculous feeling. I won't deny that, but I kind of think it's is somewhat fitting, that moment when someone's absolutely had it up to here and loses it. A complete outpouring of emotion and rage. I completely agree this could have and should have been executed better. The profanity is excessive and it also seems unprofessional to name your ultimate attack PK Kill. But ultimately, this fight stands as the thing most people are going to remember about this hack, for better or worse. Thematically, it contrasts with the Gygus fight. Gygus' attacks were incomprehensible, but the Doctor dramatically announces everything he does. And while you had to pray to defeat Gygus, the Doctor and this game makes it completely clear violence is your only option here. Oh yeah, I forgot the actual boss fight. The fight's good. It's great, even. 
He has multiple phases, and each of them needs a different strategy to defeat them. He switches the kinds of attacks he uses, encouraging you to change which armor you have equipped mid-battle to negate fire or ice, which is great. That's a mechanic you never needed to use in the base game. His ultimate attack can and should be reflected. And then his final form is a straight-out slugfest. Both sides throw everything they have in a last-ditch attempt to win. This encourages every strategy you've used so far. Shields, status effects, elemental weaknesses, and draining someone's power points. It even gives you some rooms to experiment instead of just giving you one choice. You can stop his huge attack by draining all of his power points first if you get lucky. It's mechanically interesting, it's thematically fitting, and it tests everything you've learned about the gameplay so far. Or you could just have Pooh mirror him, which he is shockingly not immune to. If you get lucky, Pooh can use this melee attack and diamond dies the good doctor and kill him instantly. My brother discovered this by accident when he played through this back in the day. It's uh, pretty much the greatest thing ever. I especially like how it breaks the scripting, so he can't give his final speech, which makes sense. He's now a statue. But either way, you beat Dr. Andernuts. He has some last words for you. And he ends up dying anyway. Hmm, this seems familiar. All jokes aside, it's clear this hack is exploring much of the same themes as his contemporary deconstructive games. It has similar statements about violence and player choice. Varric is a bounty hunter. He kills monsters for money. This is an RPG. They're usually all about hunting down and fighting enemies. And in the end, Varric kills the big bad guy to bring peace back to the world. The only distinction is the hack makes you want to go back to find a better way and hits you hard when you realize you can't. Regardless, Varric actually gets to survive in this ending. It's pretty anticlimactic, but I think it works. It's a return to normalcy from the beginning before the monsters. Varric's journey is finally over. And the credits even bring Megalovania back because just once wasn't enough. So that's the hack. It's about four to six hours long. It does some interesting things with Earthbound's base gameplay and characters. I found it genuinely unnerving and tear-jerking at times. Toby hasn't commented about this hack very much in the years since, and he doesn't seem to look back on it very fondly. And I can understand why. Every creative mind looks upon their early efforts with a deep sense of embarrassment. I, uh, know I do. Is his later work an improvement on the hack? Absolutely, especially in terms of polish and accessibility and gameplay. But the themes of player choice and the relationship between player and player character in battles that feel more like miniature puzzles to solve. All this has been carried forward into his new work. Clearly, this is just the kind of thing he likes making. And it's also the kind of thing I enjoy playing. So, in the end, from me to you, this is a thank you for making things that made me laugh and cry and feel fear and triumph. And at the end of the day, I don't think I'll ever forget about Radiation's Halloween hack. <laughs>